shorter blasts. And then there's the, the Teruah, which is nine quick blasts in short succession. Uh, this series is then blown 11 times for a total of 99 blasts. The final blast, the 100th blast, is known as the last trump. So again, in 1 Thessalonians, when it says, at yeah, the last trump, he's referring to the Feast of Trumpets. There's all of these connections that if you don't understand, you're going to miss what he's trying to say. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, is where he says, I show you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the shofar will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, we'll all be changed. And so we see here, this is a Feast of Trumpets uh, event. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's important I want to bring out. Song of Solomon is one of the most misunderstood books in the world. Uh, it's not about at all what you think it is. I, I don't know of anyone who really gets a handle on it. Uh, again, you can go to our website where it says more studies, and you can read about the Song of Solomon or hear about the Song of Solomon. The notes are free. The audio is free. It's actually about the festivals, and it's a prophecy about the second coming. And the church is asleep, and the church needs to wake up. That's really what it's about. And what do we see in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11? Here the bride is speaking, and she says, My beloved spoke, and he said unto me. So now here he is speaking to her. And he says, Get up. So what is she doing? She's in bed. Okay? And, but in a most beautiful, tender way, he says, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter has passed. The rain is over and gone. She didn't sleep one night. She went into hibernation. She slept all winter. Okay? He says, it's time to get to work. The, the rain speaks of the blessings of God. God wants to bless us. And he says, you're stuck in the church, in the building. You're not going out. You're not working the harvest. You're stuck in there. Get up and come out with me. And what does she respond in verse 16 and 17? She says, my beloved is mine. And I am his. So in other words, he's saying, you belong to me first, and then I belong to you. I got Jesus in my pocket. I'll pull him out when I need you. Otherwise, you go play. She says, he feeds among the lilies. But look at what she says. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I want you to turn, my beloved, and be like a row or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Bether in Hebrew means to separation. It's kind of like the, the Rockies or the Cascades where you're on one side and you're telling the Lord, you go on the other side of the mountains and you do your thing. You work the harvest. I'm just fine right here. And so what we see in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, she says, by night on my bed I sought him. That's typically when most people seek him too. By night on our bed, last thing we do, say a few prayers. But what does it say? She says, I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now, kind of late, okay? But now she says she's going to get up. And she says, and go about the city and the streets and then the broad ways. What do we know? Broad is the way of destruction. She could have been at her groom's side, working the harvest, but now she's outside in the dark at night, going the wrong direction. And she says, I sought, I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I could not find him. So this whole book is about the body of Messiah being asleep, not wanting to work to harvest. They try to seek the Lord. They can't find him because he's left. Remember the church of Laodicea where he stands at the door and he's knocking? He's knocking at the door of the church. A lot of people think that it's at the unbeliever. Open the door of your heart to Jesus and he'll come in. No. He's knocking at the door of the church. And they're saying, leave us alone. We're having church, Lord. They don't even realize he's outside. <clears throat> Song of Solomon 5, verse 2 through 6. Again, here she is asleep. You see this constant thing all through where she's asleep. And he keeps trying to woo her and wake her up. She says, but my heart's awake. Well, what's fascinating to me is that there's different English words for sleep. We go to sleep, but we also put our dogs to sleep. Different word. Well, in Hebrew, it's the same thing. And you don't see this if you're looking at the English. The word sleep here is the same Hebrew word that's translated those that sleep in the dust of the earth. So she is at the point of death is what that's saying. But she has a slight heartbeat. <clears throat> She's almost at the point that her heart's beating. Okay. And she hears the voice of her beloved that's knocking. Okay. But in Revelation, it's a knocking means to rap. But in Hebrew, this knock means to beat on the door. So here she is in the house, and the Messiah is beating, almost like he's trying to do CPR. Wake up, woman. You know, he's just beating on the door. And he says this time, the first time it was get up. This time it's open. Why open? Because the door is locked. She not only was in bed, she locked the door. And he says, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. He has tender words for her. He's not angry, but he's beating on the door because he wants her to wake up. It's like doing CPR. He says, my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drop of the night. He's saying it's pouring down rain. 
But it's not because he wants in. He wants her out to enjoy the rain, which speaks of the blessings of God. It's the same thing. But look at what she responds. She says, oh, I've taken off my coat. You want me to put it back on? I've washed my feet. You want me to get them defiled? You want me to get dirty out there? And it says, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels are moved for him. Oh, she claims to have all this love, all this compassion. Oh, I really love the Lord. But she doesn't do what he says. And she says, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels moved for him. And I rose up finally to open to my beloved. Oh, but guess what? I had to stop and get all gussied up here. Uh, my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. So she not only had it shut, she had it barred. She wasn't at the window watching, eagerly anticipating his return. She was in bed sleeping. He has to wake her up. And then she says, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself. He was gone. Oh, my soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. So you're going to see the Song of Solomon is not what you think it is. It's, it's, it'd be fascinating for you to go to our website. It's all free. But Ephesians 5.14 even gives you this idea of Yom Teruah, where he says, Wherefore he saith, Awake you that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now it's also known as Yom Hadin, which means the day of judgment, the opening of the books, or the opening of the gates. Like I said, God always has desired to forewarn us before he brings judgment, okay? The problem is some of the churches like Lot and they're asleep. Some of the churches like Abraham and they're interceding. Who do we want to be like? <clears throat> the number 40 has always been a time for testing and for warning. It was 40 days for Nineveh. Uh, for Moses, after the golden calf, he went up for 40 days. 40 days, the Lord was in the wilderness. The 12 spies spied the land for 40 days. And uh, in Numbers 13, 24, and 25, it talks about how the place was called the Brook Eshkol, because of the cluster of grapes, okay? So because you're hearing about the grapes, you know this is like in August, September, when the grape harvest is coming, uh, where the children of Israel had cut down from there, and they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And so what's fascinating is uh, the 40 days, in, on the biblical calendar, a low one is 30 days long that month, and then you have 10 days to Yom Kippur. So it's 40 days from uh, the, the first of Elul to Yom Kippur. And those 40 days are very significant. That is the exact 40 days Messiah was in the wilderness being tempted. The same 40 days the spies were out spying. All of these things happen at the same time. John the Baptist, when he was doing his ministry, calling people to repent, was during these days of Teshuvah. Uh, teshuvah means to re the days of returning or repenting. Started in the month of Elul. Now, consciousness of going to a trial always precedes the trial itself. How many of you ever had to go to court? Okay. How many of you uh, lost some sleep over it? Okay. You're very conscious that my day is coming. My day in court is coming. Well, in Revelation 14, 18, it talks about an angel coming out of the altar, which had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle. And he said this, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Okay, so what this is telling you, again, this is a fall feast event because it's, the grapes were a fall feast harvest. Now, you may, I may have ever heard this term before, oh, yay, oh, yay, this court is in session. Uh, but how would you like to hear it when it's the right honorable judge of the universe who's presiding? Uh, when it's uh, the great white throne or even the Feast of Trumpets, uh, what is known in Judaism, uh, on Yom Teruah, the books are opened. And everyone passes before the heavenly judge. This is every year. They believe every year, like a rehearsal, every year. The heavenly books are open. Uh, they're like troops in review. God looks at everybody, uh, decides who's going to live that year, who's going to die that year. You know, where he's going to describe the righteous in the book of life, you know, or the wicked in the book of death. And then on 10 days later on Yom Kippur, the books are closed and the sentence is meted out uh, that following year. So uh, in Judaism, it is believed that every year on this day, the heavenly court is in session. The books are opened, and what God is looking at, he's looking over each one of us, all of our accounts, to see how we took care of his investment that year in us. The trial lasts 10 days until the Day of Atonement, so your life is placed on the balance scales. Uh, this trial image also captures the sense of one's life in someone else's hands. We have 10 days to repent and amend our ways during this time before the judgment is set and the books are closed on Yom Kippur. And so during this time, it's like everyone in the world passes before the heavenly judge like troops in review. The sentence is then meted out the following days of the next year, which is always good why during those 10 days, a lot of people are praying and fasting. When you get into the festival cycle, it's just like a rhythm, and it's just phenomenal. 
2 Corinthians 5.10 says we all must appear before the judgment seat of Messiah. Okay, so every one of us are going to receive the things that are done in our body according to what he's done, whether it's good or bad. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, as a matter of fact, it says, Every man's work will be made manifest for what? The day shall declare it. It's referring to the Feast of Trumpets. It doesn't say a day. It says the day. The article the is specifying the Feast of Trumpets. He says, because it's going to be revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is, you know, whether it's going to abide or not. Some of us are going to suffer loss, and some, you know, fire is only bad to wood, hand, stubble. It doesn't hurt gold, silver, okay? It purifies it. So, uh, fires to be afraid of, uh, depending on what you're made out of. In Daniel 7, uh, verse 10 through 11, it talks about how a fiery stream issued and came forth from before the throne here. And it says thousands of thousands ministered to him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Can you see Yom Teruah here? See, I'm just going to give you scriptures. I'm not putting my two cents worth in here. I'm just giving you a scripture showing where they get this concept of this is the day the books are opened. And then he says, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain, his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. I believe that event will happen during the feast of trumpets to Yom Kippur. Matter of fact, in Revelation 5, 11 through 13, it says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He's seeing the same thing Daniel did. Okay? Again, every verse in the New Testament, every concept is tied to the Tanakh. If you can't find a connection, you have a misinterpretation of something. Revelation 20, uh, verse 11 and 12, it talks where he sees a great white throne. Okay, this speaks of the Feast of Trumpets. He says, And I saw him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. So you see the, the resurrection of the dead. You see the books are opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their work. This, this event will happen on the Feast of Trumpets. I'm telling you, I don't know what year, but you're going to see there's the Feast of Trumpets, the, the tribulation will begin on the Feast of Trumpets, but you also see this event will happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, a lots of events happen, but they always happen on God's biblical calendar. Revelation 4, 1 and 2, what do we see? Remember I said it was the opening of the doors also? After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Okay, John is seeing the Feast of Trumpets. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a shofar, feast of trumpets, talking with me, which said, come up here and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and beheld a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. He's seeing the judgment seat. This, this, this speaking here is taking you right to the feast of trumpets. This event will happen on that day. Now I said, it's also the opening of the gates. From Psalms 24, 7 and 9, it says, lift up your heads, O you gates, be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and who's going to come in? The king of glory is going to come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory is going to come in. So these gates are going to be open on the Feast of Trumpets. That's when he's going to come in. Now, how many of you want the gates open for you when you're coming? Okay, look at Psalms 118, 19, and 20. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Well, they're going to enter on the Feast of Trumpets. Matter of fact, look at Isaiah 26, 1 through 3. Ties right into this verse. It says, in that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open you the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose might is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Can you see the opening of the gates, the opening of the doors, all tied to the Feast of Trumpets? Joel 2, 1 and 2. Blow the shofar in Zion. Sound a teruah in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is nigh at hand. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and strong that has not ever been alike. Neither shall be any more after it, even in the years of many generations. So we can see uh, we have a feast, this Feast of Trumpets at sunset on September 29th all around the world. In almost every time zone now, we have people blowing shofars at sunset in their own time zone, blowing the shofars. We're going to try to do this every year, try to get people to sign up to blow shofars at sunset. Boy, what a concept. People from every tribe, nation, tongue, denomination finally uniting 
like an act in one accord, acknowledging the festivals. <clears throat> the time is coming in Joel 2, 11 through 13, that it says that the Lord's going to utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who's going to abide in it? Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, he is merciful, he's slow to anger, he's of great kindness, repents him of the evil. So many of us see God as like Thor, throwing lightning bolts at the people down below. But God is not like that at all. He's slow to anger, he loves us, but he's trying to warn us. And it's time for us to do those things, to repent, to fast, to weep, and to seek him. Zephaniah 1 again, verse 14 through 16, the great day of the Lord, it is near, it is near, it hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. And it says it's going to be a day of trumpet and alarm. So now we're going to take another look at the Feast of Trumpets. It also means uh, Yom HaKaseh, which means the hidden day. So let's go back to Zephaniah and see what that's leading us to. If you remember in Zephaniah 1, I was talking about, you could hear it, the great day of the Lord, it even hasteth greatly, it's near, it's near, it's near. So God is telling us prophetically, okay, guys, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I used to live in Kansas where there was tornadoes. It's one thing when you'd hear it be several miles away, but then they would sound the alarm, hey, it's here, get to the basement, you know. Well, in Zephaniah 2, he's saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it hasteth greatly. So then what does he say in verse 1 through 4 of chapter 2? He says, gather yourselves together, O you, uh, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Now look how many times he says the word before. He says it several times because it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, we need to hurry. He says, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes a chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, what are we to be doing? It says, seek you the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, that maybe you'll be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Okay, so you can see why it's called the hidden day on the Feast of Trumpets. But what's amazing to me is, I don't know if you know, but I believe prophetically this happened just a few years ago. This warning has gone out, and i tell you why. If you remember, the Gaza Strip, they evacuated it a couple years ago, and they evacuated it on a very significant day. It was on the 9th of Av. Okay, on the biblical calendar, the 9th of Av is very significant. That is the day the spies rejected the land 3,500 years ago. So that day has been cursed in Jewish history ever since then. Uh, because of that, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, he destroyed it on the 9th of Av. Several hundred years later, when Rome destroyed the temple, they destroyed it on the same day, the 9th of Av. If that wasn't a clue. All the Jews were kicked out of England in 1290 on the 9th of Av. All the Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492 on the 9th of Av. World War I started on the 9th of Av. Hitler's proclamation to kill all the Jews was on the 9th of Av. And they forsook the Gaza Strip on the 9th of Av. The same time they rejected it 3,500 years ago is the same day they rejected it. So when you look at this prophecy, he's saying, the great tribulation is coming, it's coming, it's coming, and hurry up before, do this, do this, do this. And one of the first signs is, for Gaza will be forsaken. And that happened just two years ago. So we can see it is coming upon us very shortly. But unless you understand the biblical calendar and know when these events happen, it's harder to tie these events in. Psalm 27, 5, it says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me. You can see why it's also called the time of trouble, but you also see why it's called the hidden day. In his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacles, he shall hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Okay? Isaiah 26, 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter into your chambers and shut your doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That speaks of the resurrection of the dead. Can you see how the resurrection of the dead, the hiding... The, everything ties to the Feast of Trumpets when you are connecting these dots here. It's also known as the wedding of the Messiah, the Ha Kiddushin or Nesuin. Uh, the Bible is a marriage covenant, okay? Look at Joel 2, 15 and 16. Blow the shofar, blow the trumpet. This is referring to the Feast of Trumpets. In Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. The Hebrew word for closet there is the chuppah, which is the marriage canopy. Uh, 
And so we can see again a tie-in of the wedding of the Messiah with the Feast of Trumpets. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. It talks about how the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I'm going to raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. And this is the, his name. So look at his name. This is the name that he'll be called, the Lord our righteousness. Okay? Now, do you remember the bride usually takes the groom's name? Look at Jeremiah 33, 15 through 16. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up into David, and he will execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved. Now look. And Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And so we have here the Erosene is the rite of betrothal, and the Kiddushin is the completed rite upon drinking of the cup of the covenant. Kind of, uh, you know, like the engagement versus the actual wedding ceremony. Okay, marriages were arranged by the parents, uh, just like Abraham for Isaac. Uh, typically, the young man would go to the house of the bride-to-be carrying three items. Uh, he would have a large sum of money, uh, the betrothal contract, and a skin of wine. Uh, so anyone arriving at the house with these three items was definitely considered suspect. The father of the house was saying, what do you want with my daughter? Uh, and uh, there would be a bridal price that would have to be approved of. Uh, and if the bridal price was approved, then a glass of wine was poured. Uh, but she still had to approve also. And if she approved, then the betrothal contract became a legal document between the two. And their status was now betrothed rather than fully married, even though they would be called husband and wife at that time. In Genesis 24, uh, 53, we see that the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. And he gave also to her brother and to her mother all kinds of precious things. And so we see this is what is happening. In Genesis 24, 58, it goes on to say that they also, they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I do. I will go. And so she had to have her approval. Well, in 1 Peter 1, 8, it says, Now, if you remember, Rebekah never got to see Isaac, Right? Okay, and it says, whom you have not seen, yet you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Matthew 1, 18 and 19, it says, now the birth of Yeshua was on this wise when his mother Mary was a spouse. That refers to the betrothal. The betroth they hadn't yet been fully married yet. And the word espouse there uh, means in a, to give a souvenir, a memento, to betroth. And now, the next thing I want to bring out is, if you remember, the next thing, the bridal price was established for the bride. Well, what do we see in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19? For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, the silver and gold from your vain conversation, okay? But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Corinthians six twenty says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So, what do we see here? I mean, it's, let's say you were kidnapped, okay? And uh, someone said, you want her back? You want her back? It'll cost you two bucks. You know, well, wow, thanks a lot. You know, must not think much of me, you know. Well, the fact that look how much it cost the father. Look what it cost son, the son, his life. The Bible states the bridal price, okay? And so we need to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which belong to him, because we have been bought with a price, at a great price. Uh, and then the third thing, the bride and groom are betrothed. And this legally binds the two together, but they don't live together. And you see that with Messiah. We don't live together. He's in heaven. We're here, but we're betrothed. Jeremiah 2, 2, it says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem and say, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your spouses when you went after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Hosea 2, 19 and 20 says, I will betroth you unto me forever. I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth you unto me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. So that's coming for the nation of Israel. But you can see the betrothal there. So the ketubah, it states the bridal price. It states the promises of the groom. And it also states the rights of the bride. That's the, the, the Jewish wedding document. Uh, do you realize now that the Bible is your ketubah? The Bible states the bridal price. Okay? It also states the promises of the groom. And it states the rights of the bride. Second Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yea in, in him. Amen. First John 5.14 and 15. It says the rights of the bride. It says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay? So we, we can see the whole Bible is basically our ketubah. 
And then number five, the bride always must give her consent and say, I do. And Romans 10, 8 through 10, it says, the word is nigh you, it's in your mouth, and it's with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we have to give the Lord our I do. Exodus 24, 3, at the first Shavuot, this is when the betrothal took place on Sinai with the giving of the Torah. What happens? Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has said, I do. That was their I do. That was them entering into the covenant. Uh, and then we see number six, gifts were given to the bride in Ephesians 4, 7 and 8. We see wherefore he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, so I don't want you to be ignorant. And so uh, we can see here the entire Bible literally follows the wedding uh, of the Jews. And so if you understand a Jewish wedding and what was going on, you'll get a better understanding of the second coming of Messiah. Uh, then they would share a cup of wine, and it was called the Cup of the Covenant. Uh, and then seventhly, the bride would have a mikvah. Here's a picture of a mikvah in Israel. Uh, they would uh, immerse themselves in water. It was a ceremonial act of separating, showing that the bride is leaving her former way, and she's going to a new way. Uh, baptism is not something new. Uh, that's another misunderstanding. Uh, John the Baptist wasn't the first Baptist. Uh, they were doing water immersions for... 1,500 years before Christianity came along. But she would do this water immersion. And we see this in Ezekiel 16, 8, and 9. Now when I passed by you, God says, and I looked upon you, behold, your time was, uh, was the time of love. And he says, I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yea, I swore unto you and I entered into a covenant with you, saith the Lord God. And you became mine. And then he says, then I washed you with water and I washed you, uh, all the blood off of you and I anointed you with oil. And so what do we see here? Now she's been bought with a price, and she's to spend her time preparing to live as a wife and a mother in Israel, spending her days how to please her husband and waiting for his return. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be doing, uh, learning how to prepare ourselves for Messiah's return. And then uh, eighth, they would have uh, the cup. Uh, after they would drink this cup, the bridegroom would make the statement that he's going to go to his father's house and prepare a place for her. This place was known as the chamber that I'd read earlier in Isaiah. Okay, and in John 14, 1 through 4, we see Messiah says, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. Uh, and if anyone would ask the day of the wedding, he would only say, only my father knows. That was a typical response because the father had to give the approval that everything was ready. And so when he says, matter of fact, in most translations where it says, neither does the son there, that's in italics. It doesn't belong there. That was inserted by somebody. That's a total mistranslation. It's not in the original. <clears throat> So uh, the father would have to make sure every preparation had been made before he could get his bride. Finally, there was a marriage supper for everyone that it was invited. And so here now you have the marriage supper of the lamb. Uh, Isaiah 62, 5 through 7, it says, For as the young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegrooms rejoice over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. So here's a verse telling you again, the Jewish wedding ceremony, the second coming, is patterned after that. Luke 14, 16 through 18, this is what is sad. How many of you want to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb? I mean, how many want, when you understand the divine appointments, how you want to be there? I cannot understand this, but look at this. Luke 14, 16 through 18, it says, uh, one of the parables God is speaking, and he says how uh, he's having this wedding for his son. And it says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden. Remember the, the term that were bidden, to proclaim, to call out? These are the ones that were supposed to be there. They said, Come, for all things are now ready. But what happened? They all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of ground. I had to go see it. Well, let me have be excused. You know, uh, this is a horrible I mean, this is what is going on. They don't want anything to do with the appointed times. They don't want to do anything with the festivals. They want to be excused. And then in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb is come. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're called. We're being bidden, but we need to go. Revelation 19, 14 through 8, it talks about uh, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. They were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And it goes on to say how the Lord says, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Uh, this great supper is coming. And uh, depending on what side of the table you're going to eat or be eaten. Kind of decides what side of the table you want to be on here. Uh, this is just a quick picture of, uh, I've been to Armageddon where that great supper is going to take place. If you'll notice here, uh, you see what looks like an airstrip. 
but there's no hangars, there's no planes. Why? This is where the Israeli Air Force is underground. They'll come up and take off right here. But this is an actual uh, photo of uh, Megiddo in Israel. Uh, in Matthew 22, I'm almost done here. Look at this. It talks about how Jesus answered and he spoke to them again by parables and he said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, referring to himself, who, or the father, who made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth the servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and are killed and all things are ready. Come into the marriage. But they made light of it. How many today make light of the festivals? They went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore to the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to come to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways, gathered together as many as they could find, both bad and good. Believe me, don't, uh, you need to go out and reach the bad and the good. God will take, let him do the cleaning. All too often we try to do the cleaning. God says, no, you just bring them in. Bring the bad in, bring the good in, I'll do the cleaning. Okay, we need to get out of the cleaning process as a church and get them to the Lord and let the Lord do the cleaning. But then it says the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man that didn't have on a wedding garment. Like I'm telling you, everything that's in the New Testament is tied to the Old Testament. This concept of someone coming in without a wedding garment is very significant. Uh, we'll get into that later. Then lastly, and we'll be wrapping this up, there's Hamelech, the coronation of the Messiah. This is the day that the Lord will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you imagine what it was going to be like to going through the dress rehearsal on the Feast of Trumpets? You're practicing the coronation of the King, and all of a sudden you're caught up into the reality of it. At least you're there doing it. You know, it's not like you're asleep, you're dead, you're off doing something else to your farm or your merchandise. But that's what's so awesome, to get in the habit of doing the dress rehearsals. It'll be awesome to be where you're supposed to be at the time you're supposed to be, rehearsing, going through the coronation of the King ceremony, and then have that happened. Uh, one aspect of Yom Kuru is to crown God as king. The shofar was seen not only as a call to stand trial before judgment, uh, the judgment throne of God, but to also to reaffirm God's sovereignty and his kingship over the world. And you'll see judgment and kingship are closely linked. Uh, Psalms 98, 6 through 9, with the trumpets and the sound of the cornet make a joyful noise to the Lord, the king. And it says, let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful. Why? He's coming to judge the earth and he's going to judge the world with people in equity. It was a regular practice to enthrone the kings of Israel and Judah on the Feast of Trumpets. That's why I believe that'll happen. There's four parts to the enthronement of a uh, Jewish king. Uh, first, you had to give the decree. Then there was the ceremony of taking the throne, followed by the acclamation. Uh, the subjects had to come and pledge their allegiance. So let's take a look at these in more detail. You'll see the giving of the decree in Psalms 2, 6, and 7. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. And it says, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. This day have I begotten you. Uh, then a rod and scepter is given. You see that in Genesis 49.10 and Hebrews 1.8, where it says, unto the son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, and how the scepter will not depart from Judah. So Yeshua came as a prophet. He was resurrected as a priest, and he's coming back as king. Then there's the ceremony of taking of the throne. You see that in 2 Samuel 5.3. Uh, where they anointed David king over Israel. In 1 Kings 1, you see they also anointed King Solomon. Uh, they blew the shofar, and the people said, God save King Solomon. That's the acclamation. And the, <clears throat> everyone was rejoicing. In Revelation 4, uh, you see a door is opening, and the, truck, the trumpet talking with me. Uh, the throne is in heaven, and it talks about how everyone is bowing before the throne, uh, and they're worshiping him that's on the throne. Everyone's coming to pledge their allegiance. Uh, number three, you have the acclamation where they would say, God save King Solomon. This was in 1 Kings 1, 34. Same thing in 2 Kings eleven twelve. 12. Everyone would clap their hands when they anointed him and they said, God save the king. Now, uh, fourthly, they would come and pledge their allegiance. You see this in Psalms 50, verse 4 and 5. It says, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people, gather my saints together. All those that have made a sacrifice to me that have entered the covenant. So Psalms 47 is known as the coronation psalm. You'll see this. It begins, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Can you imagine when the Messiah is crowned king of kings? Everyone's there clapping their hands as he's coming through. And it says, shout to the God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Okay, so you see the applause given. Verse 5, you have the shout and the shofar of Yom Teruah. Look at verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the shofar. So you can see the Feast of Trumpets is the day of that coronation. In verse 6 and 7, you have the shouting and praising of the king. It says, sing praises to God, sing praises. Uh, sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises, those with, that have understanding. 
And then in verse 8, you have the ceremony of the taking of the throne. It says, God reigns over the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. And then in verse 9, the believers in Yeshua are gathered in his presence and pledge their allegiance. What do we see? Verse 9, the princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. So we see the whole coronation. You can see why in the Feast of Trumpets we sing this, uh, this psalm. Uh, Psalms 102, verse 13, it says, You shall arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. The word set time there is moed. So again, it's referring to the festival. And then it goes on to say this in verse 16 through 18, When the Lord shall build up Zion, he will appear in his glory. Do you understand that? When did that happen? In 48, Israel became a nation. In 67, Jerusalem was recaptured. He began to rebuild Zion. That means we are the generation that is going to see the Lord appear in his glory. It goes on to say he'll regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayers. And then it says this, this shall be written for the generation to come. The Hebrew word there is akaron, and it means the terminal generation. So the, term, the generation that sees Zion being built up is the last generation. Okay. So finally, my last verse here, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, what do we see? John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And you'll see that uh, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword that he's going to smite the nations. He's going to begin to judge them uh, with a rod of iron. And guess what? He has a, on his vesture and, a, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Make Yeshua your king today by obeying him. Amen. Thank you.